Well, friends, we are in a series on Ephesians, uh, really dealing with the church in Ephesus. Paul wrote a letter to the church of Ephesus called Ephesians. That's the book we're working through this winter, spring season. And as we do so, we recognize Ephesus was a massive city center. It would have been the Chicago if it was in America, because there was... um, in, in the Roman Empire, there was Rome, there was Alexandria, and then there was Ephesus. So it's this massive city center, and Paul is writing to them. Paul, today we, we deal with a section in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 22, that really talk about something we don't deal with much in the church. And I think it's to our discredit when we miss it. Um, we're going to talk today and understand a little bit about the barriers that kept us out as Gentiles. We're going to take a minute and know our roots, okay? Now, let me ask you a question. You got to participate with me here, all right? Who here has drank the poison and found out through Ancestry.com who you are? Anybody? We've got one or two. The rest are lying. Who, who, no, seriously, okay, I'm not going to shame you. Let me just say, I'm going to use Erica as an example in this. So, who, who's done it? Come on, be bold. Chickens. All right, so um, here's the thing. Ancestry.com gives us a chance to look back and find out who we are. They do it in the most unique way. They send you a vial, you spit into it and mail it back to them, which I think is rude, but apparently it works. And um, they'll take this DNA or they'll take this saliva and they'll find your DNA, DNA and find out who you are. Now my wife, and by the way, you may think this guy's in trouble. No, no, I talked to her. I'm in the clear with what I'm about to share. Um, she helped me, she knows. Um, but she had been raised in a family, uh, her mom's side had uh, a strong Polish influence. Grandpa Duke Kavich was, um, was, was part of that family, the Swindell family. And uh, you, like at Easter, we have ham and we have kielbasa. We have pierogies and, and it's, it's the Polish family. I mean, you can fly the Polish Falcon and they'll get up and do a dance. Like these are Polish people, right? They cling to that identity, not hard and fast, but they know themselves to be Polish. So Erica was wondering kind of who, who is she? She has a dad who was full-blooded Dutch and, and then her mom had a number of different nationalities, primarily Polish. And um, she did the DNA test, sent it in and it came back and it was awesome because I was there when she opened the results and it said 64% Dutch and Belgium, to which her father's like, I told you the Dutch genes were dominant. And, um, and then there was 29% Scandinavian, to which Erica's reading, she's like, no. Like, it just didn't make sense. She didn't know, like, she's been cheering for Norway the past few weeks because she's like, my people, you know, like, <laughs> struggle, like, 29% Scandinavian. She's 9% British, which I always said, there's a princess in there somewhere. So, um, and then 4% Eastern European, mostly Czechoslovakian, and what's missing is the Pole in the middle of the family gene, you know? Like, where's the Polish people? She calls her mom, we're living a lie. (laughs) This is not true. Mom, adamantly, she's like, your grandpa was Duke Kavich, we are Polish. Well, my DNA says I'm mostly Dutch, and I'm Scandinavian. I'm a fish eater from boat people. What's going on? Like, she struggles with this. So Erica seemed a little bit down, and honestly, a little sad about, like, just not not that she doesn't like the Dutch and Scandinavian, but she had hoped for a little bit of more exotic bloodline. And, um, and it turned out to be more Nordic, but, um, but it was good. And so she was a little down, and I'll never forget, we're sitting there watching TV one night, and a, show, a commercial for the show Vikings came on. And this blonde Viking lady walks by, and she's like, hey, sister. And I'm like, oh, (laughs) this is really getting to you, isn't it? She's just struggling with it because she had a preconceived idea of who she was, and it turns out she's not that. She had found in the 16th century on one of those little leaves that somebody in her family got married in a synagogue, and she's like, I'm a Hebrew. She was so excited. No, none of it. None of it. You just are getting progressively more blonde. Like, it's just going further up. She's going to... She's a polar bear. Like, she's way up there, right? She's got this Nordic thing. It was a loss of identity in ways, right? She didn't know who she was all of a sudden. And what we have to do is understand that in knowing your roots, you find out something true of who you are. And in today's text, we find out something true of what God's done. 
it's really important that we understand in Scripture there are two different people groups. There are the Hebrew people whom God loved, and he chose the children of Abraham. Remember, Father Abraham, many sons. Remember, that, that's where that started, the people of Israel, the people, Father Abraham's line, the Hebrews. And then there are the Gentiles. And you're like, what is a Gentile? Do they make it at Gentex? Is it for the floor? I don't understand. Right? No, a Gentile is anyone outside of the bloodline of Abraham. Anyone who's not a Hebrew is not in the family of God. We're going to talk. And I want you to listen closely to the words of Paul as he writes in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11 to 22, regarding the separation. Therefore, Remember that, that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called the uncircumcised, which was the Jewish sign of the covenant, um, you were called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision or Hebrews. Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise without hope and without God in the world. Feels nice, doesn't it? He continues. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace. Him who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. I just need to stop right there and tell you something. In the temple in Jerusalem, in the ancient temple, there was the temple mount. It was huge. And then within the Temple Mount is this massive courtyard. And sitting in the middle of it is the temple. And the temple had an inner courtyard, and that was the Temple of Israel. And everything outside of that was for the Gentiles. You couldn't get into the Jewish temple if you weren't Jewish. There was actually a wall. Think Berlin circa 1982. There was a wall. And guards posted to prevent you, if you didn't have the right bloodline, to get in. There was a wall of hostility between the Jews and the Gentiles. They may want to know God, but they're not in the right bloodline to know God. There was a wall of hostility because Jesus destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside within his body the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create within himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace. And in one body, his body, the Lord Jesus would reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and he preached peace to you who were far away, and peace to those who are near, Jew and Gentile. For through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, you Gentiles are no longer foreigners and strangers, but you're fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household. You are built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Today we're going to talk about the Old Testament and the New Testament and the way God has woven together something that started out that divided us with the wall of hostility, but also eventually would come to include us in the blood of Christ. Today we need to talk about scripture. Now, for most of us, we read this part of scripture, don't we? The New Testament, this thin part up top. We read about Jesus, and that's good. Don't ever get me wrong. That's good. But what about this fat little part down here? We're like, I don't know. That's kind of weird. Like, they're marching around cities and the walls fall. A guy gets eaten by a huge fish. I'm going to go with Jesus, right? And you just kind of put your nose where you feel comfortable. But this is our book, too. Unless we forget that Paul said that it, this, this gospel is built on the foundation of of the prophets in the Old Testament and the apostles. So it would be good to take a minute and understand that the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, the, the Bible pre, prior to the Gospel of Matthew, everything up to that, is an important living text of the Word of God that we belong in. 
See, it's not just a group of stories about the heroes of the faith, faith, but they're in there. It's not just a story about God getting mad at sin and the wrath of God and the pain of sin and the hard like living of God's people, but that's in there too. It's actually full of different kinds of books, and it's written by multiple authors. You have books like the book of Esther, which was written around 460 uh, B.C., before Christ came. And it's in the Old Testament, and it's a historical narrative of what God did to save his people who were in exile in the Persian Empire. You have books like the Psalms. Anybody ever heard of Psalms? Yeah, oh, so your arms do work. Hmm. Okay, so, um, so you've heard of the book of Psalms. Psalms is nothing but poetry and worship songs that the people of God would take and use in temple and uh, in synagogue worship. When they would pray a prayer of confession, it would be Psalm 51, the Psalm of David after he was caught in an affair and the murder of Uriah. It has psalms, psalms of praise, Psalm 46. Like you have all these different psalms. There's poetry in it. It's the centerpiece of the Bible, and it's the place we praise and worship. That's in the Old Testament, Psalm 23. You know, the Lord is my shepherd. We all know that one. We're comfortable in there. We also know there's books of sorrow and lament with like Jeremiah and Lamentations and Ecclesiastes and the book of Job. Poor Job, right? We have the books of lament. We have the books of the law, the Torah that God gave to Moses, the Ten Commandments. You can look in the very front of the Bible. It's called the Pentateuch, the first five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And within those books is contained the stories of the origins of humanity right up through the giving of the law and the people of God in the wilderness about to take Israel, the land. See, the book of the, the Old Testament has all these things packed into it, and it can get difficult to read sometimes. I recognize that. Sometimes you're reading the Old Testament going, so did this happen now? They they don't write it chronologically. When they canonize scripture, they didn't make it chronological. So sometimes it's hard to figure out where you're at. You can get into the prophets, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Daniel, the major prophets, right on down through Hosea and Amos and all the way to Micah, the minor prophets speaking the word of God, and you can go, okay, you can get lost there, because there's so many people, and you can ask the question, why do we have a book with so many authors, at so many times over such a span of time, writing these stories and documenting it? Why? Why, why, why? And what's the purpose? Well, the reason why is because it's telling one story. The amazing thing about the canon of Scripture is that Scripture from Genesis with the first words of God tell Revelation with the final trumpet blast and the words of Christ on his second return. In between those two bookends is a story telling one thing, God's redemptive plan for humanity and his love for them. The story that God writes in the Old Testament is primarily the story of the promise of redemption. In the New Testament, we have the fulfillment of that promise in Christ Jesus. But in the the Old Testament, it's the continued promise of God's redemption of his people whom he loved, the Jews. He would redeem them. He would save them. In the Old Testament, we find this fulfillment. So it's not just a random compilation of stories. It's not like an old TV guide with a bunch of small stories into it. It's actually a living, breathing book telling the story of God that he was going to redeem it and he knew it would cost him dearly when he created us. He chose us before the beginnings of the world. So we recognize that this book, which is so alive and it details God's covenant relationship with people from the very beginning, Abraham, the start of the covenant, all the way up through Jesus Christ and now us, the saints. We recognize one story has been told. But now we have to recognize we have a participation in it. And we need to step back and realize how honored we should be to live in this moment. Here's the reality. We've been grafted in to the heritage. Is anybody here good with trees? I won't make you come on stage. Any gardeners? I don't know. Are you called good with trees? Are you like a botanist? Is that? I don't know. Anywho. Not time to figure that out. We have one person back there. I'm good with trees. Love it. All right, so if, you've, if you're good with trees, you know you can cut off a branch of an apple tree, cut a notch into it, 
and stick a cherry branch into that notch, tie it on with some twine, and that apple tree will grow cherries off that branch. You can graft into a healthy apple tree a cherry branch, and it will grow cherries. They actually have trees. I was studying about this. I found it awesome. They have trees. Remember fruit cocktail when you were little? Anybody ever get sent fruit cocktail in your lunch? You peel it open. You're like, a grape. And then you bite it. You're like, oh, it's soft. Oh, you know, and it's horrible. You're like, thankfully, it's in heavy syrup. Oh, you know, and then the rest of the day, you're like, ah. But um, so you have, you have fruit cocktail. There's actually a tree that has plums, pears, like five kinds of apples, and cherries growing on it. That tree down at the base has to have such an identity complex. I don't know who I am. Because look up there. There's cherries and pears. There's apples. I'm a freak. Right? You know that's going on. But they, they, they graft into the good, healthy stock of a tree that is deeply rooted and drawing life out of the ground and nourishment out of the ground. They drive into the ground and they pull that out and then they attach different limbs that are fruitful to it. That's us. You are grafted into the family of God to be uniquely fruitful because Christ tore down the barrier that kept you from being close. You are not kept at a distance as in the old temple. You are drawn closely to God. Here's the coolest part. There's a new temple. There's a new temple. And we as Christians need to understand the value and the place we have in it. Because if we are grafted into the family of God, then we have to, well, attach ourselves to that family's practice. But what did Christ do? He fulfilled the law. And he changed things about the temple. So let's just talk for a minute about the old temple. Remember how I said there was the temple mount? massive, and then the temple itself, and a wall and a barrier that kept the Gentiles, the outsiders, out, and it progressively got more narrow. It was the court of Israel, then the court of men, women couldn't get in there, and then the court of priests, and then the Holy of Holies, this place where only God dwelt. The Ark of the Covenant, the two cherubim sitting, facing over each other with the mercy seat and the law of God in the Ark. And a priest only went in there once a year. And it was such a deadly event that when the priest went in, they tied a rope and a bell around his foot so that if he died because there was unrighteousness or sin in him, they'd just drag him out. It's so like Paul didn't get it together. And they'd drag him out. Because in the Holy of Holies, only one could go in one time a year, and it was who God selected. Think of how structured and religious, and now there's a new temple. There's a new temple. Christ's work had made the old temple obsolete. Christ's work invited all believers together to create the new temple. So I want to go back and read this to you. I want you to hear these words from Paul. Remember the structure and the systematic severity of the old temple. And this is what Paul, a Hebrew's Hebrew, who came to know Christ, writes. You are fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household. You are built on the foundation of the apostles, Peter, James, John, Paul, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, the apostles, the ones who followed Jesus, and the prophets, the Old Testament. The prophets prophesied about Jesus. You want to know if the, the people of Israel had any clue Jesus was coming? Read Isaiah 53. Read Psalm 22. Super legit. It's really kind of cool. You are built, Paul says, on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Faithful people who faithfully declared the truth of God. But you were built with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In ancient masonry, a cornerstone set the dead level grade and the base for all the structure. The cornerstone was just super important. And Jesus Christ were built on the apostles and the prophets, but it all stems out of what? The chief cornerstone, Jesus Christ himself. In him, the whole building, the temple, is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. This is how I apply this, pretty cleanly. Erica was fairly sad she wasn't a Hebrew. 
right? You were in Fiddler on the Roof in high school, and you were Zytle. Nope, you weren't. You were a Viking pretending to be Zytle, right? She had an axe. She's going to hurt somebody. She did, she knows, she's in the wrong bloodline. She's in a hurt locker unless, wait a minute, there's a new way. Jesus Christ made the way. He removed the hostility of the wall. He removed the barriers, and he said, come to me, all you who are weary, and I will give you rest. Oh, that feels good, doesn't it? That there is nothing keeping back a Gentile from walking with the Hebrew closely with Christ. There's nothing keeping us from walking closely with God. It doesn't matter that her ancestry isn't Jewish. It matters that she is in the bloodline of Christ because he died for her, for me, for you, for them. Jesus Christ is the bloodline we claim that tore down the wall of hostility. But it wasn't just a wall between Jews and Gentiles. There was a wall between God and man. Remember our God graph? Good people can live as much as they want, as good as they want, but you can never be sinless. Jesus Christ tore down the barrier between God and man, and he made us all one body together. That is the best news possible, because if you're a really good person in this room, you are on the same dead level ground as the worst person in this room. There is no better or worse in the kingdom of God. There is simply the redeemed in Christ Jesus who are invited to come to him at his pleasure. And as we need, we get brought close to God because we were bought with the blood of Christ. We were bought with the blood of Christ. So for you and I, we need to recognize there's a couple easy ways to apply this in our life. First of all, we're going to take communion today and we're going to recognize the sovereignty and the altogether perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ to redeem us. But there's some things you can do at home. First of all, if you're scared of this part of the Bible, this back part, I want you to read it. I don't want you to be scared. Start in Psalm 1. Start in Psalm 1. Such a good book. You'll even hear some imagery that um, might make you think of being grafted. Because in Psalm 1, it says that um, blessed is the man who doesn't walk in the path of sinners, sit in the seat of scoffers, and, and do these things. But he's, he is like a tree planted by streams of living water. And he gives his fruit in abundance in season. And we're grafted into that tree. We are grafted into the bloodline of Christ, the most fruitful of all creation, and we are bought at a price and pulled up into his life. So I want you to read the Old Testament. Start with Psalm 1. Spend some time in the Psalms. It's over 140 chapters. You'll be there a while. It'll be great. You'll be great. You can read the, the prophets. You can read the historical books. I want you to feel at home because the Old Testament isn't just the Hebrew Bible. It's yours. It's ours. There's no dividing wall. We are the people of God, and this is our word. This is where we turn to hear God speak. So spend some time in the Old Testament. Second thing is, don't put up walls and say, who can and can't come to Christ. Be mindful that Christ tore down all those barriers. There is no one who does not deserve the love of God in Christ Jesus. And here's the coolest part. The temple was a place where people would gather to honor God. Paul said it this way, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? You are the gathering point where, where you are the place where the Spirit lives and you, us gathered here together, when we leave, the temple leaves with us. This building remains an old grocery store, not a church. You are the church. You are the living temple of God called to go out and break down all the walls of hostility. And say, you know what? I don't care what you've done in your past. Christ died to redeem you. We, as people, have to be willing to admit we love to put up walls and say who can come and who can't. But that has nothing to do with the faith we aspire to in Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ tore down the wall of hostility, first between us and God, and second between us and the right bloodline. And then he bought all of it back with his own blood. My friends, the gospel of Jesus Christ is this, that all who are weary, all who are trapped in sin, all who are owned by their past can find their future, their purpose, and their identity in him who stretched out his arms on a cross and cried, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do.
Lord Jesus Christ. Today we, we gather as your people and we ask that you would give us courage to live faithfully with you. Not to tell you who can and can't come, but to celebrate with you that you have brought us to you. A living temple that our lives could give witness to you. So God, we gather today at the table and we ask, come Lord Jesus. And may it be a moment of grace for us who need so much of that grace. In Christ's name, amen. Well, friends, I told you we were going to have communion today. Um, and communion is sacred and is special. It is one of the two sacraments that Jesus Christ instituted and participated in. Baptism and the Lord's Supper, communion. It's special to gather at this table, even though it's just a small piece of bread. And today we gather at this table in remembrance, in communion, and in hope. We gather in remembrance because, well, we just heard what Paul said about Jesus tearing down the wall. We gather in remembrance knowing that God the Father sent Jesus Christ into this world to fulfill all obedience to the divine law, even to the bitter and shameful end of his death on a cross. But by his death, by his resurrection, and by his ascension, Jesus Christ secured for you and for me an eternal covenant of grace and reconciliation. We get to be forgiven, redeemed, and made right with God. And he did that so that not one person would ever be pushed away, but all are welcome to come and receive grace and reconciliation in the blood of Christ. We come to have communion, which is relationship. Think of sitting around a table with old friends, sharing memories of what happened in the past and where you're at now. We come to have communion with this same Jesus Christ who made the promise at the end of his life that he will be with us always, even to the very end of the age. Today we come to have communion with him who never left us. In the bread which we break, we realize that Jesus Christ, his broken body, is the bread of heaven which will strengthen us unto life eternal. In the cup which we bless, we recognize that the words of John 15 are true, that Jesus is the true vine in whom we must be well grafted and connected to if we are ever to bear any fruit. Finally, we come in hope. Let's think about hope for a minute on a week like this. When another person has walked into a school and wrecked the lives of thousands of people in South Florida. When bombs are going off in different places in the world and killing innocents. It's hard to have hope in a world where we define ourselves by what we hate and what we can't stand and what we're against. But today we come in hope. We come in hope, not hope that we manufacture, but hope that Christ gave us. The hope that says this, that this small bite of bread and this small taste of juice is a practiced promise, a small fulfillment of what it'll be like one day when the heavens are torn open and the Lord Jesus Christ returns and calls us his bride home and we gather with him at that eternal table of the marriage supper of the Lamb and we celebrate and we party and we joyfully have life together and we get to look at Jesus with his face unveiled and see the one who redeemed us and the one whom we love. But we also get to be made like him in his image. He perfects us. He redeems us completely. This is the hope we're called to. We're called to the yes, we are redeemed, but the not yet. We haven't yet arrived at that beautiful supper, but we promise, we believe God promised he would return. And so we take this bread and this juice in hope that this world doesn't have the final narrative on his work. We come here to be mindful today that it's not just us who receive communion. You're not the only Christians in Zealand, right? There's like, if you put a pin in the foundry and drew a 10-mile circle, I think there's like 8,000 churches around us, right? There's a lot of other Christians getting ready to do what we're doing. If you put a pin here and just, well, draw a circle around the globe, there's billions of us who gather at this feast today. And we should be mindful that we participate in this as individuals on a global scale. This, my friends, 
is the remembering that we are in the communion of saints. It's not just us, it's us together, doing the work that reveals that the temple of God is alive and well in his church, by his spirit, through the blood of Christ. Join me in prayer. God, as we approach the table, I ask that you would help us to confess any sin that lies in our hearts. Help us to forgive those who's, who've sinned against us as freely as we've been forgiven. And join us in this moment. In this moment of sacred quietness where we trust you to do the work only you could do. To tear down the walls and to call home us who had wandered so far. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he was sitting at the Passover meal with his disciples, and they were looking at him, and he took the bread, and he broke it, and he said to them, this is my body. It's been broken for you. As often as you do eat of this, do so in remembrance of me. In the same manner also, he picked up the cup, and he poured the cup with the disciples looking on, and he said to them, this, this is the New Testament, and it's written in my blood. As often as you drink of it, do so in remembrance of me. Friends, communion is an open table at the Foundry Church. All are welcome who confess Christ. If Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, you're welcome to come for communion. If you're a child in this place, the table is open to you at your parents' discretion. I know some people struggle with that, but I want to remind you it was the Passover meal the Hebrew equivalent to Thanksgiving, where Jesus did this. It was always a family meal. And you can say, kids don't know what they're participating in. I would respond to you, I don't think I fully understand the mystery and the grace given to me in it either, so maybe I shouldn't take it. We come to the table not as people perfect, but as people redeemed. In the blood of Christ, to participate with him in the good gift of salvation, of remembrance, of communion, and of hope. There will be ushers that come down and dismiss you, and you will come to one of the communion stations. We will hand you a piece of bread, and you will take that and dip it in the juice, and then you'll eat that. If you have gluten-free issues, you can, or you need gluten-free, we do have gluten-free bread here available. Just ask one of the servers. I'm going to ask the um, ushers to come forward at this time. When the ushers are in place, we will go ahead and dismiss you to come and receive communion. Elders, if you'll go to your stations, all things are now ready. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. In the face of that world, there is chaos and pain unbounded. But in the face of him who died for you, there is a peace that quiets the soul and purposes the life. May you live in it as you go from this place. My friends, the church must leave the building. You're dismissed.